My name is Henry Kaminsky. I'm the Chair of Neurology and Rehabilitation Medicine at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And most importantly, I'm the uh, Principal Investigator for the Myasthenia Gravis uh, Rare Disease Network that's supported by the NIH. And looking at it historically is the best, right? So if you look at the 1950s, there was an appreciation, or you know, even back to the 1930s, understanding of how a nerve and muscle communicate, that there's a chemical signal that goes across this cleft was appreciated. And then, um, oh, we have these medications that inhibit cholinesterase, which we know works at the neuromuscular junction. Let's try them in myasthenia. Um, that's a little bit simplified, but basically we understood the nerve muscle communication. And then we found a medication that worked to enhance that. Then through the 50s, it was thought, okay, well, this might be one of these things that's an autoimmune disease, which, you know, this is just autoimmunity and immunology was just being defined then. And interestingly enough, um, you know, that did lead to use of corticosteroids in the 1950s and patients got a lot weaker and that was all abandoned for several decades. Um, and then in the 70s, as uh, you know, I said, the John Lindstrom was studying this acetylcholine receptor, again, to understand how nerve and muscle communicate, injected it into rabbits and lo and behold, the rabbits got weak. Fortunately, he, um, he and his group thought about this a little bit more and said, There's, these are probably antibodies. They're injuring the nerve muscle junction. Boy, these rabbits look similar to patients with myasthenia. They did electrophysiology recording and they saw the same kind of um, signaling problem. Then they saw that these antibodies bound to this purified receptor if they took it out of took the serum out of rabbits. And so again, here, all of a sudden, we can say, here's this auto antibody. So then you proceed a little bit. Now you can recognize these patients because you have a blood test. Well, you got an antibody. What can we do to get it out of there? So then there's plasma phoresis gets developed and you start or applied. And you start taking these antibodies out of the bloodstream. And lo and behold, these patients who are in the intensive care unit who can't breathe are suddenly significantly improved off the ventilator. They're doing great. Um, and then around this time, a little bit before, it's like, okay, let's just try this prednisone again. And we learned how to use it. And this big gunshot um, into the immune system, which is how we use corticosteroids for high doses for months. Um, suppresses many activities of the immune system, uh, <clears throat> in particular lysing those lymphocytes that produce antibodies. But then it's appreciated, we're really compromising these patients with the prednisone. It's an awful situation. So, you know, doctors looked at ways to try to treat an autoimmune condition with immunosuppressives. So we stole things from rheumatoid arthritis and more common diseases that were using immunosuppressives like azathioprine at first. Um, and then now we've added mycophenolate and tacrolimus over the years. They're, now they're, they're all of a sudden a little bit more specific. They're eliminating B cells or compromising T cells that are activating these B cells in myasthenia, and then we couple that with what immunologists are doing to understand, oh, you gotta have these B cells to produce myasthenia. Oh, but it's, that's not the whole story. You, if you don't have T cells that are activating the B cells, you can't get myasthenia in animals. And then you start looking in humans for these things, and you see these specific uh, antibody producing cells in humans. So now, it really becomes a lot more interesting, right? Because now we know we have the ability to target B cells like rituximab. You know, it's an anti-CD20, it's very specific to um, lymphocytes. And I think we fully expect that this is the magic bullet. We're gonna give people rituximab, everything is great. And it's just not that great. 
especially in acetylcholine receptor positive myasthenia. It just doesn't work that well. But lo and behold, another group discovers in 2000, there's other antibodies. So the 80% of patients who have the acetylcholine receptor antibodies, well, what about the other 20%? So it's discovered that there's a muscle-specific kinase um, as an autogen, autoantigen, which then over the next couple of decades, we see this really works well in, um, the, the rituximab works well in muscle-specific kinase antibody myasthenia. Well, what does that mean? Well, it looks like there's different flavors of these antibody producing cells. Some that have CD20 and are fairly short-lived that we know. And so rituximab works on those. <clears throat> it works very well in my opinion. But then the acetylcholine receptor antibody myosin, they're probably long-lived plasma cells and they're sitting in the bone marrow, the rituximab can't get it. And they don't have CD20 on it. So like, I think that now, especially as you kind of mentioned, there's been this just progressive overlap in clinical discoveries that are feeding back to understanding of the basic pathophysiology. And we're still borrowing from you know, other conditions on um, you know, therapies and development and, and better, um, more specific um, treatments that eliminate long-lived plasma cells. So um, it, I mean, I think it goes back to the original point that this is really a great disease to model treatments for. And, you know, we, we can now dissect the intricacies of the, um, you know, immunopathogenesis of myasthenia. And having said that, we still don't know what triggers it basically. You know, ten percent of patients have a tumor called the thymoma that triggers the disease. We can take it out, doesn't stop the disease. So what's perpetuating it, it's not understood. The um, non thymoma associated myasthenia, we have early onset young women who have a thymus that looks like a reactive lymph node. We have older individuals that don't have that reactive looking lymph node. Um, so there's, there's, that as we understand this better, we see that myasthenia is a bunch of different subtypes as well, which, you know, a couple of decades ago really, you know, wasn't thought as clearly that way. So, um, you know, we learn, learn more and more. And, but then, you know, I, I don't know how close we are to really finding what what I and patients want, right? The reestablishment of tolerance with no um, adverse effects. So they can say, I'm done with this myasthenia gravis. That's still a, a bit ways off. And even though we have all these treatments, like I said, um, when you got so many, not all of them work for all patients. So I think we can get a lot of people better, but there's still some that is not the case. Mm -hmm.